Hey, you know what? At the time of recording, the gaming industry isn't exactly in the best of places, and we've seen many sides to its ugly face rearing again and again in the forms of sexual harassment claims, crunch development practices, rampant toxicity, and of course, mindless actions by end consumers themselves that range from review bombing to scalping of consoles that unfortunately continues to deny people access to the latest generation even a year after its release. And so you know what? It's time to draw a line in the sand and put our foot down onto said line, confusing the metaphor for somewhat, but making a very powerful image nonetheless, and say no. Because today, I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are the 10 most insulting video game industry habits that have to end. Number 10. Overpriced digital versions Now, in theory, digital copies of games should be much cheaper than their physical equivalents, as the production and distribution of discs and packaging, which is a sizable portion of publisher costs, is now eliminated. But somehow, they are almost always priced more expensively with no cost savings passed on to the customer. For what seemed like forever, the retail price of a new game was seemingly fixed at around $39.99, gradually increasing to $49.99 during the last few years and jumping considerably to $69.99 for the latest console generation. Given that games cost tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to make, this is at least somewhat justifiable given inflation over time, but it represents a sizable financial outlay to customers, particularly in an era where rentals are now non existent and demos are very rare, limiting the ability to try before you buy. Now, savings can be made on physical copies by shopping around, given that retailers seek to undercut one another, and some of the expense incurred through purchase can eventually be recouped through a trade-in on the second-hand market. Digital-only distribution by comparison offers only a take-it-or-leave-it price with no residual value. It is clearly the industry's plan for the future, but one that its dominant players really need to reassess their approach to. Number 9. Pointless DLC it used to be a case that when a game was released, that was it. Developers would swiftly move on to their next project, powerless to make any further additions to the one that they'd just completed, which led to fairly rapid turnaround cycles rather than the once-per-generation releases in huge franchises like Final Fantasy and Grand Theft Auto that we see today. The dawn of downloadable content gave developers the power to continue working on a game post-release. Ostensibly, this should have been a win-win for both them and players alike, the former able to generate additional revenue and the latter able to derive additional enjoyment from a game. In an era where seemingly every title has a season pass, however, the practice seems heavily skewed towards the financial side of things. Some DLCs are captivating packages of new content, expanding the world and mythos of a game and introducing new mechanics, but for every Witcher 3, Blood and Wine, or Borderlands 2's is, 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 is D&D homage, there are myriad of superfluous releases that add nothing to the base game and are entirely skippable, likely out of a fear of alienating players that have already moved on from a game by the the time its DLC releases from future sequels. Number 8. Non-gameplay trailers Trailers for future releases are a huge deal in the modern games industry, comparable to their film equivalents in terms of awe-inspiring visual spectacle. Increasingly revealing showcases are now dropped over the course of months or even years through events like E3 and the Tokyo Game Show, and shared to the world in an instant through the likes of YouTube. Sometimes these can have little relation to the actual game itself though, and are purely designed to incite buzz, such as the case of the highly emotional initial trailer for Dead Island that earned plaudits from Steven Spielberg for its cinematic credentials, no less. Far more annoyingly is when seemingly incredible visuals are presented as if they were gameplay footage, but the graphics in the actual game end up not matching them at all. Now, this can be partially attributed to the quality of televisions, given that games are showcased in 4 or 8K resolution, but played through devices that usually only support 1080p or 720p, which will understandably make them visually inferior. But publishers are far too often guilty of sexing up footage. Criticism of the practice could be constructed as trivial. I mean, does anyone truly care about Spider-Man's puddles, for instance? But deceptive marketing that misleads customers can never really be justified, regardless of its commonality. Number 7. Day 1 Patches Remember the days of purchasing a new game and being able to play it immediately? Just picture this scene. It's Christmas morning and you've unwrapped your first ever games console, and now ignore the rest of your presents to boot it up for the first time. A couple of decades ago, you'd have to be dragged away away from it several hours later to eat dinner. Nowadays, you'd still be doing the bloody hardware updates and system configurations and software installs before the end of bloody Boxing Day. Now, installs are an unfortunately necessary 
evil that have come hand in hand with the technological developments that make modern games possible. Though it's painful to watch a gauge trickle along at a snail's pace in areas with lower internet speeds, once it's done, it's done, right? Well, wrong. Because patches are another necessary evil. Bugs and glitches should be identified by developers through their in-house testing, but the ability to stamp out any that emerge post-release or amend unbalanced gameplay without needing to recall the products is definitely a godsend for them. But what isn't necessary are the huge patches that immediately follow the initial install, often taking just as long to process. A game shouldn't ever be pressed to disc or released to a digital marketplace in an unfinished state. But the fact that they are and that day one patches are now often the norm is a damning indictment of quality control procedures. Number 6. Impossible Trophies and Achievements A considerable portion of gamers do not care in the slightest for trophies or achievements, disregarding them as digital tokens that only die-hard completionists pay any attention to. Those that do, however, will spend countless hours grinding their way through the trophy or achievement list of every game that they play in search of perfection. Sometimes they are afforded a fairly simple ride, tasked only with completing everything they'd complete in the game anyway. Other times the journey is long and arduous, but ultimately still doable and immensely satisfying to conclude. All too frequently, however, a list is rendered impossible after a couple of years by online trophies that become unachievable once servers are switched off, or by challenges that are so ridiculous that they cannot be accomplished by anything other than sheer luck or best in the world levels of skill. I mean, take Fall Guys' requirement to have players win five games in a row, or more historically, Fight Night Round 4, which featured just a singular belt for each weight class to be won, but didn't enforce the one player in the world that actually held the belt to bloody well defend it. It's a seemingly minor bugbear, but trophies and achievements should be a fun pursuit that are consistently applied on a game-by-game -game basis rather than a complete afterthought. Number 5. Empty Open Worlds Grand Theft Auto 3 changed gaming forever, that is a fact. Whilst it wasn't the first game to feature an open world explorable by players at will, it popularised the concept, which is now ever-present across a host of genres. Contained linear environments are now quite rare by comparison, and even traditionally level-based games like first-person shooters or platformers now usually have hubs to traverse. If done right, open worlds are fantastic, offering countless hours of enjoyment to inquisitive explorers, who are rewarded for going off the beaten path. Hours can be spent roaming Red Dead Redemption 2's vast countryside, with nary a dull moment to be had between tracking animals, uncovering easter eggs, and interacting with dynamic non-player characters. But if done wrong, they are soulless creations, sparsely populated and filled with content that seems to have been created solely for content's sake. The most recent Assassin's Creed trilogy boasts a well-crafted story, but many players likely gave up on Origins, Odyssey, and Valhalla well before finishing them as they just grew tired of the chore of going from question mark to question mark on the map and clearing out identical bases. Empty open worlds offer developers a lazy way of advertising that their creations are far longer than they actually are. Stuffing dead space with nothing bar the odd collectible is definitely not the way. Number 4. The Death of Offline Multiplayer Contemporary multiplayer gaming is defined by players connecting to others across the world through nothing more than a router and a headset. Many gamers will fluctuate indiscriminately between remote pursuits with their real-life friends and those that they only know virtually. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. The ability to partake in activities with others without having to be in their physical proximity has been a lifesaver over the last couple of years, and is convenient even in a non-pandemic situation. What is wrong, though, is when games have online multiplayer but lack an offline equivalent. Flashback to the late 90s or early 2000s and multiplayer gaming was defined by crowding around a television considered minuscule by modern standards, squinting to play two or four player games on split screen. From Mario Kart to Time Splitters, the possibilities were endless. Gaming like this is still an enjoyable pursuit when time and societal conditions allow, but it is an experience alongside offline co-op play on campaigns that developers have neglected for far too long. Offline options are now often either bare bones or completely non-existent, even in games where their presence would be logical, such as racers or shooters. We live in an increasingly isolated world. Restricting offline multiplayer does nothing to alleviate that. Number 3. Always on DRM Now, DRM stands for Digital Rights Management, and it serves as an umbrella term for all of the tools and practices that developers put in place to prevent the unauthorized use, modification, and distribution of their creations. Piracy is a huge issue in the gaming industry, and there is an obvious need to have preventative measures in place. But the ones taken have become increasingly heavy-handed and even draconian, such as the rise of one-time install codes that killed the pre-owned market for PC games almost overnight and massively inconvenienced anyone wanting to play a game on a second device, such as a new bloody computer. Some 
Some DRM measures, though, are pretty funny. Batman Arkham Asylum punished pirates by removing the ability to glide, preventing them from progressing in the game. Others are more irritating than insulting, though, such as the trend for acquiring players to log into an account on the developer or publisher's platform that is separate to their PSN or Xbox Live account to track their progress. Some, however, are criminal, which is rather ironic, and the worst of the lot is DRM that requires players to be always online. Progress can be lost in an instant if servers or the connection of the player goes down and play can then be prohibited, even in single-player experiences like Hitman or Assassin's Creed until rectified. God help anyone who lives rurally, right? Number 2. Annual Sequels Every year, the latest version of EA Sports' FIFA shoots up to the top of the charts, with players trapping themselves in a cycle of buying it, criticizing it for being little more than a roster update that replaces gripes with the previous version with new ones and then continuing to play it all year nonetheless. Activision's Call of Duty then follows a couple of months later with the formula of each game being near identical even though development is shared across three studios that ostensibly seek to put their own unique touches on the games. Annual sequels are a cash cow and nothing more. Many other franchises have thankfully veered away from the practice given the saturation and quality drop that ensues when a new game is rushed to release every 12 months, allowing little time for innovation and often blatantly reusing textures and animations. They won't stop whilst FIFA and COD continue to hold the number one and two spots though, even if Vanguard's sales are considerably down on those of Cold War and Modern Warfare. It seemed as if Konami were set to challenge EA's model this year by making their FIFA rival an occasional release that they would then prop up with annual DLCs, but instead eFootball has been one of the biggest launch disasters of modern times. Great. And number one, microtransactions and pay to win. Money. It's seemingly all that matters in a capitalistic society. The moment that games companies realized that they could repeatedly eke small and seemingly trivial amounts of extra money from customers after their initial purchase, they immediately sought to exploit that fact. Almost every game has a marketplace that is full of extras that can be bought with in-game currencies, cars in racing games, and items in RPGs to name a few. Usually these are purely cosmetic, with games like Fortnite and League of Legends offering hundreds of skins that confer no gameplay benefit on the buyer. Now proponents of such microtransactions argue that they are harmless ways of making an avatar unique, whilst opponents argue that they are exploitative, with susceptible players being pushed into consistently making new purchases. Completely undefendable by contrast are pay-to-win mechanics, which offer an advantage to the buyer over other players. These have ruined a number of online games like Star Wars Battlefront 2 and its loot boxes, for example, and unbalancing them and making the best players those with the biggest holes in their wallets rather than being the most skillful. Some governments are finally taking a stand against the practice, arguably years too late given that it is exploitation of the highest order, but at least some progress is being made. Oh wait, no it's not, because they're just constantly changing the terms of what it is, and therefore they're always staying one step ahead of the law. Brilliant. And there we go my friends, those are the 10 most insulting video game industry habits that have to end. But unfortunately, probably won't. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. Am I in the right? Am I in the wrong? And I'm just an old man yelling at the clouds? Let me know either way, I love to read your comments. And if you want to chat to me further, you can do so over on Twitter at RetroJ with a zero, or we can swing by Live and Let's Dice, where I do all of my Warhammer streaming and battle reports and stuff like that outside of work. It'd be great to see you over there. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.